Welcome to the Grammar of Words. This is one of a number of linguistics lessons on this site, and it will introduce you to how languages build words. We'll cover two basic topics in this lesson. The first is going to be the components of words, and the second will be a way to classify types of languages based on how they do build words. Two concepts to get you started. The first is the morpheme. This is our basic building block in the grammar of words. A morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit you can break a word down into. Each word has at least one morpheme. So, for instance, the word dog is both a word and a morpheme. It's the single morpheme dog. If you just break it down to the d sound or the g sound, you're no longer working with morphemes. The word dogs in the plural, more than one dog, has two morphemes. It has the morpheme dog, and it has a s sound, or a z sound, that tells you it's the plural. The morpheme dog and the morpheme plural make the word dogs, which has two morphemes. A second concept to get you started is an allomorph. An allomorph is a different way that the same morpheme can show up. We talk about morphemes as being a general underlying concept. I gave you the example of dog with S, and that S is a plural morpheme. You can see that it makes the word plural. If we add that same plural S to another word, we sometimes see that it shows up differently. For example, in the word hats, it shows up as an S sound and not as a Z sound. So the Z sound and the S sound are two allomorphs of a single plural S morpheme. There are different types of morphemes. There are morphemes that can stand on their own, like the word dog. These are known as free morphemes. It doesn't have to be attached to another morpheme to be used. Morphemes that do need to be attached to another morpheme to be used are known as bound morphemes. Take the example of plural S. Do you ever say just S on its own to mean plural? Plural S always shows up at the end of other morphemes, like in dogs. That makes it a bound morpheme. Two types of bound morphemes occur in English and a variety of other languages. Derivational morphemes and inflectional morphemes. Derivational morphemes allow you to form new words, new concepts out of other morphemes. Inflectional morphemes convey grammatical information. An example would be the S in the word dogs that we've already talked about a few times. That conveys the grammatical information, hey, this word's plural. So keep an eye out for both of these types. Bound morphemes are generally bound in a fixed position with respect to the morphemes they're attaching to. Morphemes that attach before another morpheme are known as prefixes. Morphemes that occur after another morpheme are known as suffixes. There are other examples that actually occur inside of another morpheme that are called infixes, and bound morphemes that attach around another morpheme, which we call circumfixes. I guess you can say that these are a little more exotic. All of these are known as affixes, which is a Latin way of saying that they're attached to another word. Languages have other techniques at their disposal for expressing grammatical concepts. One of these is a clitic, which is kind of like a free morpheme, kind of like an affix. It sits alongside of, and is pronounced along with, the word that it grammatically relates to. A zero morpheme, or a null morpheme, is a morpheme that doesn't get pronounced. This concept of a silent meaningful unit is strange at first, I know. We can argue for its existence based on the grammar of a language. So knowing that English speakers differentiate between singular and plural, it could be argued that dog actually carries a zero morpheme. So these two morphemes, the free morpheme dog and the bound morpheme zero morpheme, allow us to identify the category's singular noun. It's one dog and not multiple dogs. Another fundamental concept is periphrasis, which uses multiple words to express the same grammatical concept that another language might express using an inflectional morpheme. There's also compounding, which takes two free morphemes and sets them side by side to represent a new concept. In that way, it's kind of like attaching a derivational morpheme in a language that allows it, but the two morphemes are free. So we can say, for instance, dog house doghouse, which attaches the free morpheme dog and the free morpheme house to come up with a new concept. Rearranging word order is also a useful technique that's very common for expressing grammar. We have some additional terminology for talking about languages that like to bind morphemes. 
the root morpheme is the base that carries most of the meaning. Any derivational morphemes added to the root would help form the stem to which affixes can be added. Inflectional affixes would not be part of the stem. Any derivational affixes, however, and the root itself, would be part of the stem. And if it's on its own, it's both the root and the stem. Languages that tend to use bound morphemes are known as synthetic languages because they tend to put morphemes together to form words. At the other end of the spectrum, an analytic language does not use bound morphemes. So each word on average in an analytic language is a free morpheme. Types of languages that use bound morphemes include fusional languages, which are rarer but basically fuse together information, grammatical information, into an inflectional affixes. So they tend to have a lot more meaning in their affixes and fewer affixes. Whereas agglutinative languages tend to have more affixes, but less overlap between grammatical meanings in each individual affix. This lesson has covered morphemes, allomorphs, and very roughly how different individual languages build out words with morphemes. Be sure to check out the page for more information and exercises, and I'll catch you in the next lesson.